So, good afternoon again, and welcome to this final CARES conference session of the day. We're going to focus on the decarbonisation of, of heat uh, in this final session. My name is James Buchan. I am the Local Heat Development Specialist for Local Energy Scotland. I work within the development and delivery team at Local Energy Scotland, and I champion local heat projects and support the wider CARES team with specialist advice. I also have my colleague supporting this session this afternoon, Chris Morris, who you might have heard earlier on, who manages uh, the Local Energy Scotland uh, scheme. Just a, a bit of a refresher um, from this morning, just the, the goals and ambitions of, of, of CARES. Um, CARES' reason for, for being is to support communities across Scotland engaging and participating in this transition to kind of net zero and very much our remit to supporting community involvement and shared ownership local energy systems, uh, maximising uh, income to communities from community benefit opportunities and the need to uh, support the two gigawatt installed capacity target by 2030. At Local Energy Scotland, our team, uh, we delivered the, obviously the, the CARES programme, the Community and Renewable Energy Scheme for the Scottish Government and as well as um, providing grant and loan funding, uh, our team uh, involves development officers which are regionally distributed and have that local support available to you. We also have, in my role, specialist support that we can come in and uh, look at more sort of high technical projects or you know difficulties and try and sort that sort of thing. And obviously, we're a funder um, as well, helping to support projects. We do have lots of ancillary resources in terms of our websites and suppliers, case studies, if you would. And I encourage you to, if you've not had a look at that, to have a a wee look. But in the main, we're a grant funder, a loan funder, and we also assist you through that journey uh, of renewable energy. So what I'll do at the moment is I will introduce the speakers, if you bear with me just a second, I will stop presenting. Okay. Um, Bear with me just a second. So we have this morning from Sue Cairns um, from the Scottish Government highlighting the challenges and the opportunities relating to the decarbonisation of, of heat uh, coming to the, the heat and building strategy draft, which was discussed at that point. You know, we've got to rapidly upscale, you know, the development and deployment of zero emissions heating systems. And indeed, the target is well significant. It's more than doubling installations each year so that you know by 2030 we have a million homes and 50,000 non-domestic buildings um, converted you know to low carbon and, and, and uh, renewable heating systems. I think CARES can contribute to these targets by supporting the transformation in community-owned uh, buildings and we're certainly supporting that through our recent call uh, Let's Do Net Zero Community Buildings where we're offering up to 75 percent Grant intervention on um, renewable heating and low carbon heating uh, systems. So, really, without uh, further ado, we're very happy today to have the opportunity to take that discussion a bit further forwards, and we're delighted to welcome our panel speakers uh, today. Uh, first to introduce is Melanie McCray, who is uh, head of local energy at the Scottish Government, and Melanie will be discussing and focusing further on the heat and building strategy and delivering the net zero transition. Uh, following Melanie, we will be have uh, Ken Brady. Ken's a programme manager uh, for district heating at the Energy Saving Trust, and he manages the district heating loan fund on behalf of the Scottish Government, which presides, provides low interest loans and support for heat networks uh, across Scotland. And finally, we'll have Donna Marshall. Uh, Donna is the head of low carbon communities with the environmental charity Changeworks in Edinburgh, and she leads a team delivering the West Linton project, which we'll hear a, a bit more about, and she'll give a wee bit of presentation on the progress uh, to date. So without further ado, uh, Melanie, can I invite you to perhaps deliver uh, your part of the, the session, if that's okay? Thanks very much, James. Um, I will my presentation. Okay. A second. Um, while that's happening, I'm um, just say delighted to be here today. Um, as James said, I'm Head of Local Energy at Scottish Government. Um, 
a disclaimer before I start the presentation. I started the job this week. Um, moving over from um, heat strategy, um, but I have worked in the, in the in this area uh, for for a number of years now. So hopefully that should be loading up. Can you see that? Okay, everyone. James, can you see that? Yes, yes, that's fine, uh, Melanie. Okay. Yep. Um, thank you, everybody. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about the heat in buildings um, strategy and dive a little bit more into some of the detail around communities and um, the potential that um, lies in the net zero transition for heat in buildings um, uh, over, over the next um, number of years. So um, looking at just a bit of a quick recap, you obviously heard um, Sue's presentation earlier um, and she ran over um, the emissions reduction that we need. We've obviously seen big climate change targets um, in Scotland and these emissions reductions that we need um, to see to reach net zero. So what that means is, um, just to recap, that by 2030, um, to meet our net zero targets, the building sector will need to um, have an emissions reduction of almost 70% of the current emissions by 2020. So in, in, in reality, and what that, that means in sort of on the ground, that means we need to see very significant progress towards all homes reaching EPCC. Um, the majority of um, our off-gas homes switching to fossil fuels, uh, sorry, switching from fossil fuels to zero emissions heat, and at least one million on-gas homes switching to zero emission um, alternatives. Um, and, and also just to sort of flag that we're looking to see the equivalent of 50,000 non-domestic buildings switch to zero emission alternatives as well. Um, the main technologies by which um, this will happen, or we see as the primary technologies um, and measures are energy efficiency, heat pumps in off-gas areas, heat pumps in on-gas areas, um, and also low and zero emissions heat networks. Um, we expect that there will be niche rules um, for other technologies such as bioenergy and other fuels. Um, hydrogen also um, may play a role towards the end of the decade, um, but at the moment these strategic technologies have been identified in the heat and building strategy as those we know most about now in terms of operation and also in terms of cost and efficiency. Um, and in all pathways to net zero um, in, in, in um, the climate change um, committee's research, it's clear that um, taking an, a, a broad approach across these strategic technologies is um, the main way to make progress through this decade. So we're really talking about nine years um, to make this significant progress. So as James said and as Sue earlier, this is really um, quite a significant um, and increased pace of change that will impact um, all of us um, and it's something that will impact our homes and buildings um, and isn't um, something that's going to happen far away from us. So looking really a bit more into um, community energy and local energy. We do see and specify in the strategy that we recognise that communities will have a key role in this journey towards net zero emissions, um, as will all of us, um, be it um, on a domestic level or on a business level on a, on a, um, uh, for network, network organisations and local authorities. It really needs to be a, a joint collaboration to, to achieve this challenge. We do believe that um, it will be really important for communities to be involved in the decisions and um, the transition and also to um, take part in the decisions about which solutions are most appropriate for their area. So we recognise um, at the Scottish Government that there is no one size fits all. We've identified these strategic technologies um, and 
our support mechanisms will will um, focus on them, but there will be um, regional approaches in terms of delivery and in terms of how things are rolled out and when and where. Um, and it will be really key for, we feel, for communities to be involved in, in those um, decisions and in, in the future solutions for areas. And this might include planning and identifying and delivering um, on projects for both heat and energy efficiency. Um, we're working at the moment with the team at Local Energy Scotland um, to understand further the models and solutions that would be most appropriate um, for communities in Scotland in terms of heat decarbonisation. I think we're at a very early stage in this um, new care support programme and that's a really great opportunity to start to tailor the support that we have available to meet the needs of communities um, to enable them to meet this transition. So we'd be really keen, I think, today especially to hear um, and through feedback through the Local Energy Scotland team to hear more about um, some of the opportunities and challenges that you might see available um, in this heat transition. Sue spoke out about earlier about the opportunity to um, be involved in fuel poverty projects. We've obviously got statutory fuel, fuel poverty targets as well and alongside our finalised heat and building strategy we will publish guiding principles to ensure that we don't leave anyone behind in the vulnerable or most protected uh, or are protected in this in this transition. Um, so I think that's an interesting area to um, look further at how communities might play an active role in this. Um, also to highlight area-based approaches. Um, so thinking about how whole areas might move forward in terms of heat decarbonisation, how community organisations might play a role in, in this transition. Um, Sue also mentioned um, getting involved in infrastructural projects. Um, we've it's uh, got statutory um, heat network targets now um, and there is a, a number of heat networks across Scotland but the targets that we have in place see that um, mean that we will have to grow the heat network assets that we have. So there's opportunities there um, for communities to um, look at what might be possible in terms of heat networks and indeed connecting community buildings to, to them um, and also looking at co-ownership of communal heating solutions and we'll um, sure hear more about that in due course. Um, there we had a, a recent funding call that's been mentioned today, the Green Recovery Funding Call um, for community buildings. Um, and there's been a, a wealth of um, applications coming through for that. And I think that's really the first step for us in starting to understand um, how we can support communities towards net zero um, emissions in buildings and, and the role that they can play. So um, I think we'll, we will um, have some really interesting projects coming out of that funding round and be able to share um, the knowledge across um, communities in Scotland to um, promote some of the best practice examples that we see. But also really keen today to hear about um, people's ideas for taking forward community energy projects in this space. Just to flag the um, Community and Renewable Energy Scheme, um, this scheme has been in place since 2013 um, and has supported a, a huge number of projects as you've heard about a, a number of times today. This financial year we've got up to 5.5 to 5 million loan and grant funding um, and also some additional £3 million funding for um, remote uh, and rural grid networks. Um, I mentioned the funding call um, already, let's do net zero on community buildings and we'll hear more about that soon. Um, but we really, uh, I can't, sort of, I want to emphasise that CARES has now a greater focus on work get and supporting communities to work together to address and champion um, heat decarbonisation on a local level. The last um, slide I have today really just touches on um, local heat and energy efficiency strategies and this is something that Chris and the team asked if, asked, asked if we could, um, if I could cover. Um, local energy, local heat and energy efficiency strategies or um, known as LHEs if you've heard that phrase, that um, acronym, they um, are part of our heat and building strategy. Um, we see local heat and energy efficiencies um, as part of the future for a place-based movement for locally led um, and tailored approaches for the heat transition. 
local strategies and the delivery plans um, that underpin them will provide an area-based approach um, to energy efficiency and planning and delivery across local authority areas. Um, we wish or we hope that these will be in place um, by for all local authority areas by the end of 2023. Um, and these will really be the basis of forming um, pinpointing areas for targeted intervention in relation to heat decarbonisation, um, looking at zoning particular areas for certain um, types of investment, um, and also provides a framework for real partnership working and bringing everybody around the table to consider local heat and energy efficiency across an area. Um, if there are something you're aware of in your area, um, that's helpful and one message today is if we if anybody would like more information about them um please do get in touch and we'll be happy to do that but the first point of contact for everybody out there in terms of community organizations would be to speak to your local authorities and um, to understand where they are in the process for developing those strategies and also um the delivery plans and we would encourage you to engage um where you can with the strategies as they develop and also looking at the delivery plans and um, hopefully thinking about how communities then might be involved in the delivery of those those um, priorities which are identified through those plans. So as I said there's more information on our strategy about it in the draft heating building strategy and the, and to be in the final the final heat and building strategy when that is published soon um, but happy to um, either take questions today or um, uh, come back with more information if anybody would like to. So I think in summary, um, as I mentioned at the start, our statutory targets are very demanding. We'll, we'll need to see a high pace of change in terms of um, moving towards um, net zero emissions um, for our buildings and the way we heat our buildings. It, the transforming um, the way we heat our homes and buildings is going to touch the lives of, of almost everyone. Um, we will need to change our, uh, the way we heat our homes, our places of work and our community buildings. Um, it might not be a straightforward journey, um, but I am confident and cities have demonstrated this in the past in Scotland that they have taken um, forward projects and innovated and pioneered, really leading the way globally um, and, it, and that is globally recognised in, in community and local energy. Um, so it would be really great to have communities on um, uh, taking forward projects in this area. Um, our flagship CARES programme, obviously we'll, we will align that into um, supporting priorities for heat in buildings and we'll it will continue to play a critical role in supporting action for uh, achieving our net zero targets. Um, and then finally, we do want communities in Scotland um, to engage in the development of these LHEs plans um, and strategies um, and take forward and um, partnership approaches to the delivery of projects. So that is me. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I will hand back to you, James. That's lovely, Melanie. Uh, thank you. If you could perhaps finish presenting and uh, okay. we can move forward that's command thanks very much yeah interesting what you say about l heat actually um obviously being the, the heat development specialist i've been all over the heat buildings strategy and um that's local good. energy scotland and indeed the care scheme are mentioned within that you know to provide support to communities to engage with l heat and i think 2023 these plans have got to be in place so if there's communities out there and you're looking to engage please enlist the support of Local Energy Scotland and we can see how we can support you to engage with your local authority and, you know, um, influence plans for the future in terms of energy in your local area. Um, I'd next like to invite uh, Ken Brady from the, the Energy Saving Trust, who's going to have a discussion around heat, district heating. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. I'm just in the process of doing my presentation, which will hopefully come up shortly. Take your time. Has anyone, has everyone seen that okay? Yeah, that's coming up now, Ken. That's lovely. Thank you. Please uh, continue. 
Thanks for that, James. So yes, yeah, so today what I'd like to talk about is actually um, a particular governance model for heat networks. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with heat networks, I'm sure everyone is, but that little schematic at the bottom left of my slide shows you a sort of a central heat source connecting up various or multiple buildings. So that's just a definition of a heat network. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, but particularly the governance model of um, cooperative ownership and, uh, and again, particularly focusing on the Danish model of uh, ownership, which is a cooperative ownership, which is particularly applicable in rural settings in Denmark. In urban settings, it's mainly the municipalities who own and operate the networks, but in rural settings, it's, uh, it's uh, they're all actually owned by, by the end users, which is the cooperative. Um, and at the end of the presentation, I also want to allude to a sort of example of a, a cooperative closer to home in Surrey which has got some particular relevance again for uh, for the UK in terms of a slightly different governance model, but still a cooperative. So moving on, so uh, it's just some stats to talk about in terms of Denmark. As you can see, um, basically 66% uh, of all householders, which is a, quite a large amount of connected heat networks in Denmark, it's very commonplace, unlike the capacity here, we've got about 2% capacity in the UK and Scotland. Um, and just some stats about the actual breakdown of that uh, sector. So 70% of district heating is supplied by uh, the urban municipality schemes. So the biggest heat load is supplied by the urban schemes, obviously. But interestingly, 30% of all district heating is supplied by the, by the rural cooperatives. There's about 350 consumer-owned cooperatives. Um, and essentially, what that means is it's the end users uh, the consumers, as long as they own the building, the house or the business, they are the cooperative uh, members. They actually own the scheme. Um, and again, they range from, as I say, less than 100 up to 10,000 end users, so they can be quite sizable. And I'll, I'll come to a sort of a, a little case study, one of the sites that we visited in a field trip. But it sort of gives you an idea of how commonplace they actually are in Denmark. As I say, district eating Heat networks in the UK are still regarded as sort of novel, innovative, but I think there's a different culture, obviously, in Denmark. But as Mel said in her introduction, uh, Scottish government are very keen to extend the sector for various reasons, not least of which is decarbonisation, but also reducing fuel bills. Um, so, yeah, so that was just some stats there. And apologies for all the information that I've got in my slides. Normally, I wouldn't put as much information, but as we're going to be circulating the slides, I thought it would be useful to put a bit more information in terms of the bullet points. But um, in terms of the actual Danish model, as I mentioned, the key thing here is the governance. So they're actually owned by the end users. Um, a, the customers basically have a say in the governance, not only in terms of voting in directors for the for the government, the, the you know the senior leadership, but also in terms of any major capital spend. So you could say it's not unlike it's a factoring arrangement where owners will vote for change. There has to be a majority, obviously, for that change to be implemented. To me, that's quite critical because it actually engages with the end users. So it's not just a community group driving it, you know, the community group themselves, it's the actual customers who are actually buying into the scheme. Um, and that's really important for heat networks because it's a monopoly. So once you're signed up as an end user, you know, a heat off taker, you can't switch your supplier. And this is critical, I think, in terms of the actual governance model being, being, being important and being you know, something which we should be aiming for, because one of the challenges, I think, for community groups is to actually get that buy-in from the community. You know, certain community group members have got wonderful ideas about how to operate heat networks, but without the buy-in, I always say, without the customer, you don't really have a heat network. So you need to have that customer engagement. And this is where the cooperative model is really, really interesting, because they've all got a vested interest, basically, in making the scheme work. Um, uh, I mean, in Denmark, they do have some paid staff, um, uh, so there is sort of a technical expertise there, um, and they can bring in additional staff as and when required. I mean, the paid staff may be a manager, for example, and an admin person, and that doesn't have to be full time. But you know, you have that resource there, paid for through the revenue from the, you know, the heat sales for the cooperative. So, in terms of the finance, the key words here are non-profit. Uh, all the Danish heating companies are non-profit, including the municipalities. But this is really to maximise the benefits to the end users. So 
Any surplus that's made is used to keep fuel bills low and to invest in making the network more efficient. And interestingly, the cooperatives, uh, I've got the lowest tariff rates in Denmark. Um, it's a trend. It's really the, the, the reason for that is obvious that the end users, the customers, want to maintain the, the tariffs as low as they possibly can. Um, and obviously, if the, the, the directors who are voted in by the end users want to invest, they, may, they need to make a strong case that this investment is absolutely necessary to, to future proof and to increase efficiencies in the system. Going back to the buy in, if you can explain the rationale for the capital investment, more often than not, people are happy to pay a bit extra if they know that that money's been spent wisely. So again, that's the key thing about having that buy-in from the end users who are also owners of the network. Um, so, I mean, that thing about the lowest tariff rates was interesting to me when I found out because obviously the municipalities are also not for profit. They are driven very hard, you know, to, to lower fuel bills where possible. Um, but the cooperatives moving on, uh, you know, they are actually very efficient, very efficiently run. This is a, I went on a field trip a few years ago, and this is one of the, the places that we visited. It's a rural off gas uh, a village called Borup. It's quite sizable. It's got about two and a half thousand residents. So you can see we're not talking about Denmark. It's pretty much scaled up. It's not, we're not talking about very small, uh, you know, cooperatives here. Some of them are very large. Um, so in terms of Borup, basically, um, to say this is, this, this is one of our, our hosts pointing out the energy centre. You can see this at a village spilling out of it. It's about 20 kilometres southeast of, uh, of Copenhagen, just to give you an idea of the location. The fuel source is really large, and I say emphasise really large straw bales. They're about six foot by 10 foot. This is a byproduct from the local sort of agriculture. There's a strong history of agricultural co-ops in Denmark, and I think the actual water supplies are also run through cooperatives. So there's a cultural uh, understanding of what cooperatives are. I mean, obviously this helps, you know, with the tradition and it makes people more sort of a, it's easy for to sign people up because they know that it's a well established governance model. But yeah, so these these straw bales are absolutely massive. It's highly automated. This is what I mean about them being efficient. Um, they're built to a very high standard. The fact that they're highly automated means that you have less staffing requirement. Obviously, if there are any issues, they can bring in people, consultants externally or contractors to fix things and maintain things but they're actually sort of installed to a very high standard. The automation means that you don't need to have high staffing levels. As I say, there's one manager in this scheme, which is serving about, what, I think it's about one and a half thousand end users, um, and they've got a couple of part-time staff. They use consultants and other contractors as and when. Everything seems to operate very efficiently. The byproduct, incidentally, is used for fertilizer, so it's a virtuous circle, you know, with the local agriculture. And as I say, we visited everything, the plants, the energy center. It was, it was very impressive. Um, and the scale of this thing, again, that's the boiler there, it's a seven megawatt boiler. They've got another backup system. Um, so it uh, works very well. Um, moving on, and I think just to, to look at a slightly different model, I mean, the, the Danish model says, it's, 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 I think it's very relevant because one of the sort of um, the challenges in the UK to move things forward is to get that buy-in from the local communities. People are very reluctant to sign up to a monopoly unless they know it's in their interest. So, you know, one of the challenges I think is to encourage people that district heating is actually workable for them. Um, the Springbok is in Surrey, it's UK, it's in obviously southeast of England. Um, but it's a wee bit different from the Danish model in that not all the end users have to actually be members of the cooperative. This is a local cooperative that was set up um, in order to benefit the local area. It's not just about the heat supply, they wanted to actually sort of regenerate local woodlands and make it sustainable. And bio biodiversity was a big driver for the local co-op as well. So not all the end users in this scheme are actually members of the co-op. That's where it's a wee bit different from the Danish model, where all the end users, apart from renters, if you, if you own the building, you have to join the co-op, which I think is a good model if you can achieve it, because then everyone has a buy-in. But as I say, this is a slight variant, which I think is interesting to, to look at. So it's actually an SPV, and the capital was raised through a share offer to a social enterprise. It was actually £425,000 raised, which is quite, which is quite significant, actually, the amount of money. It's two separate 200 kilowatt boilers. I'll come to a little schematic in a minute where I can show you where the network's laid out. And it was a residential unit for retired seafarers. 
Um, and that's the big heat off taker. There's also sheltered housing and bungalows in the vicinity, but they were looking to replace their old oil boilers. So it was a really ideal opportunity to actually look at a different solution, which is wood fuel biomass. Um, and if the wood fuel is sourced locally from sustainable forestry, as I've mentioned, uh, from brash actually. And another big driver of them is job creation, but also the biodiversity. So um, the aerial view here, you can just see how the network's laid out. It's actually two separate network mains, which is interesting. The energy centre's in the middle there with 200 kilowatt boilers. Um, most of the heat goes to, to the south, to the residential centre, and the, the other spur goes out to the north, where you have uh, you know, the, the sort of sheltered housing and some bungalows. Interestingly, they have suffered some of the challenges with heat losses in that northern network. They've got 20% heat loss, whereas they're only suffering 10% heat loss to the south. And I think the reason for that is just the network run. It's quite relatively long, whereas the other one's relatively short, and also they're not taking as much heat. But they're working to try and rectify that by looking at demand management controls, uh, changing the settings for the internal uh, uh, you know, uh, immersion heaters and things like that, which are really helping to drive down that heat loss. But there still is a challenge where you've got a network where you have a low heat demand um, and you still want to connect people. It's a common challenge for, you know, long runs and heat networks. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of it. It's obviously much smaller than this of the one that I just showed you in Denmark, but it's a little village basically where they've got sheltered housing and residential units. Um, and the interesting thing here was that the co-op came along and they had a business plan, the social enterprise, to raise the share through capital. I should have mentioned that in the Danish uh, financing, it's normally uh, municipal loans, which are under, underwritten by the municipality, low interest loans, which finance the capital side of things. So essentially, if the loan isn't repaid, it's written off by the municipality. In this instance, it's a share offer. So there's no debt to be repaid, but obviously they had to raise the shares um, initially to fund it. Um, that's just a little illustration of a purple emperor butterfly, which is one of the species that they're looking to protect locally. Um, there's many others. As I say, the big driver for them is not only reducing fuel bills and reducing carbon and creating jobs, but also to create biodiversity in the area. Um, last slide, it's just a happy cooperative members at Springbok. They've got a website which is really interesting, a lot of blogs which people can follow up on. It shows you the whole history of how it was built out, the business plan, etc., etc. So there's a lot of useful, useful learnings from it. So again, just to recap, the big difference here, I think, is the governance model, which could be applicable particularly in rural settings where people, communities are looking at heat networks. Essential to get that buy-in, because once you've got that buy-in from the end users, it makes such a difference. The other key point here about the Springbok Cooperative is that the, the contractors were actually members of the co-op. Really useful in terms of accountability and to keep people on their toes in terms of installs and also in terms of ongoing maintenance. So that's another valuable lesson to get the contractors hopefully to join up to the cooperative so that they've got that buy-in as well to make sure things work well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. That was a, an excellent kind of insight. Uh, I've been across to Copenhagen on uh, <coughs> working for CARES and <coughs> certainly very advanced in terms of heat networks, but you know, in Scotland, we're very much moving towards that as well. In my local area in Dundee, um, there's existing historic heat networks, which they're trying to redevelop, and they're now at the stage where they're infilling this to try and make the network. And one of the projects I was involved in a few years ago was uh, one of the CARES funding local energy challenge funds, where we installed a 400 kilowatt air source heat pump uh, to deliver a district heating scheme to six blocks of flats. And... The Hill Park area in, in Glasgow um, in conjunction with Glasgow Housing Association. So, you know, there are opportunities to kind of do that here and especially in kind of urban areas as well. So thank you very much for that, Ken. It's very informative. Uh, I'll just come next to Donna Marshall from Changeworks. Donna, I will invite you to present. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? That's good. You can maybe just go to yeah. big it up to slide show. Perhaps. Yeah, fantastic. Great. Lovely. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much for the invite to come along today um, and tell you about this project. Um, 
I am Donna Marshall. I'm the head of low carbon communities with environmental charity Changeworks, and we've been working over the last year on a project in West Linton. Um, just to, to to say before I go through the slides that this project is still partway through, so there are there are findings still to come. Um, but I'm going to tell you today about the the progress so far and and the kind of thoughts and findings that have been coming from delivery. Um, West Linton, if you don't know where that is, it, um, it sits at the very top of the Scottish borders. It's actually on the A702 trunk road that runs between the um, between Edinburgh and the M74 through Bigger. It um, sits in the shadow of the Pentland Hills. Um, it's a, a fairly affluent community. It's quite, quite a mix of housing types, um, all ages from um, old stone built um, solid wall properties through to new developments. And the population of West Linton is um, just under two and a half thousand. Um, West Linton is prone uh, to be notably susceptible to low temperatures, um, partly because it sits in the valley and partly because it's quite high. So um, if you live like I do on the other side of Bigger and travel through to, to Edinburgh um, quite regularly, um, it's known for being the place where you go through pretty deep snow um, on occasion. Um, so, oh, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about this um, community-led um, project and um, what we've been involved with. Um, we're, we're really interested um, in the decarbonisation of heat. It's no surprise to anybody we're living in a climate emergency and, and doing nothing isn't, a, isn't an option. Um, and it's probably been talked about quite a bit today about the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions that come from our homes and, and workplaces. Um, and reducing these emissions is one of the most important things that we can do to help end Scotland's contribution to, to climate change. Um, as an organisation, we're very interested in the decarbonisation of heat and particularly how to support communities um, to do that and to make progress towards net zero. Um, we know that there's some pretty um, bold targets that, that um, need to be achieved um, and we are really interested in exploring some of the potential models that there might be to um, work jointly, collaboratively with communities um, and find out what role they can play, what role we can potentially play to, to support them. Um, and um, for us, we're also really interested to find out if that model could be, could be made sustainable in some way. Um, so when we set out to um, run a project, at the time we didn't know it would be West Linton, um, it, it was part of our strategic plan and the, the kind of objectives that we set for ourselves of what we'd like to achieve is to develop and uh, refine a route map to um, through a pilot that would, that would give insights into mainstreaming low carbon heat and also to demonstrate how those solutions could become business as usual. We also wanted to learn about the effective messaging that needed to be used around low carbon heat to encourage the uptake. Um, and also to understand um, the, um, to increase the level of understanding in by the public and householders and the associated behaviour change that was required. Um, and also to um, explore the potential for bulk buying or community led schemes um, or some sort of paid for service for the owner occupier um, sector. So the, the first phase of this was a lot of um, kind of death based data and um, to look at potential areas in the, the southeast area that we, we tend to cover and um, that might be suitable. Um, suitable in terms of um, having enough properties that were heat pump ready and also um, a, an engaged community that would that would um, be willing to work with us and be interested in taking this forward. There was quite a number of areas that we um, shortlisted, um, and that, but at the time running parallel to that, we were also delivering the Change Works in Peebles project, which was an energy efficient Scotland transition pilot. Um, and that project was um, to support the owner occupied uh, sector in Peebles and wider Tweeddale area. Um, to install energy efficiency measures, um, low carbon heat and also behaviour change. And through that work and through engagement um, in that project, we um, got in touch with Sustainable West Linton, 
which are a really active community group um, based in, in West Linton. And there was the, the bottom up desire um, from them. So West Linton was one of the areas that was coming out in our data analysis that might be a, a great pilot. And then um, the, the almost kind of perfect marriage, we also had a community group that, that um, said that they were interested in doing something. They had a bit of an aspiration to become an oil free village. They're very dependent on oil at the moment. Um, and, um, you know, kind of recognised that communities had that key role to play in, in the journey towards net zero and wanted to do what they can. Um, so that was where the decision came about that it would, the project, the pilot would focus on West Linton and District. And then we moved into the next phase, which um, was around kind of the pre-launch development. So early engagement with stakeholders. Um, developing a project plan, developing an engagement strategy, and also really importantly, the evaluation plan. So what would we want, what questions would we want to answer? This, this is a pilot after all. Um, we wanted to make sure that they, um, we were really structured in um, collecting baseline information and also um, answering the questions that we would want to come out of, of this exploratory um, project. So the phase three has become the, the West Linton delivery. Um, it's um, known as the West Linton and District Heat Pump Initiative. Maybe not the most imaginative of titles, but it kind of says what it does on the tin. Um, it's exclusively for homes in and around um, West Linton. And um, we would work with the community to help identify low carbon heating opportunities within the community. And importantly for that community, what we were going to offer, because this was a pilot in um, part of our strategic plan and something that we wanted to do, we would offer a handholding service for those homes that wanted to progress. Um, so that's basically a support package um, that would um, support with procurement of an installer, installer right through to um, like looking at quotes, making sure that the, the right um, option had been proposed for the household and then right through to the, the quality assurance and monitoring and evaluation and working with the households to resolve any issues that weren't quite up to scratch with the, the installation perhaps. Um, and leading through to successfully installing renewable technologies in their homes. So this was the, the customer journey that we um, came up with, with Sustainable West Linton, um, the, the kind of process that we would want to go through. And this allowed us to identify the partners that would need to be involved. So there would be initial engagement and marketing, working with the community to raise awareness of um, low carbon heat um, alternatives um, and for that to lead through to an expression of interest to get involved in the, the project. We then partnered with Home Energy Scotland, who um, the, the inquiries went through to. Home Energy Scotland's technical team um, performed a home energy check on the properties, those that were interested, um, provided general um, kind of all round home energy advice. And if the property appeared to um, be kind of on the surface of it suitable for the, the project, they would then make the referral through to our team. Um, after the referral for the household came through to the team within Changeworks, um, we then did the, a bit more of a kind of technical check on the property. So looking to see whether the property had the right levels of insulation. And if the property was suitable, making the referral through to the installer, doing the quote analysis for the householder. Um, so when, when we procured the installer that was to be used, which we did through Public Contract Scotland, um, we had a kind of set of criteria of what we were looking for them to offer in terms of um, both price and quality. And um, the installer was um, able to offer a 25% discount on the price of the heat pump system because of the volume that we were hoping to achieve through this project. Um, and so we were, um, it's really important that we worked with the household to make sure that that discount has been applied and it's the right system that's been proposed for their, their house and um, you know the, the kind of right quote has been provided. Um, and then we also did some baseline monitoring and evaluation at that point as well, looking to see what, what somebody looking to achieve through the installation of this system, what kind of level are their bills at at the moment, and um, what's most important to them so that when we came back to, to revisit it afterwards, we could do an assessment against those criteria. Um, so for homes that are then, you, you can imagine there's drop off along the way, there's homes that maybe are interested but not yet suitable in terms of their levels of insulation and this was just a heat pump um, installation uh, programme rather than a kind of deep retrofit um, and then there's, um, you know, properties that come through that decide not to, to go any further when they get further advice but then a kind of smaller number going actually through to the installer to get a quote. 
uh, or tomorrow, another uh, sur survey, first of all, a quote, and then hopefully a heat pump installation if they're happy with that quote. Um, Changeworks um, would come back into the, the process then again to do the quality assurance check on the installation that's been um, provided and then provide follow up advice and support and kind of tariff advice and behaviour change advice, etc. Um, and that's um, hopefully when somebody's journey would come to an end through the project with a um, wonderful new heating, low carbon heating system for their property. So the various kind of roles that the different partners had. Um, so our role is was around the kind of initial engagement, the project introduction, making the referrals through to contractor, looking at quotations, reviewing them, assessing them, the post installation quality assurance, um, and then just kind of hand holding and personal support throughout. I mean, we you know if you're in the know about heat pumps, it's a fairly kind of normal technology, but for a lot of people, this is a it's quite space age. <laughs> you know, it's quite a new thing for them to think about. So we, you know, that's been quite eye opening is actually the amount of hand holding that households have needed to to have the confidence to to go forward. Home Energy Scotland um, were providing the initial referrals through to Changeworks once they'd done the home energy check, carrying out that home energy check and a custom report on the property and also the funding application support. Um, the the um, Home Energy Scotland loan 75% cashback limited time offer um, came about actually after this project had, had started, which was brilliant timing for the West Linton community. So just about everybody has actually taken advantage of the Home Energy Scotland loan um, to raise the, the funding required to install the system um, and Home Energy Scotland and ourselves have provided that support for the funding application. Um, Sustainable West Linton, their role within the project has been um, as local engagement, local champions of the project, that whole kind of trust building, introducing us as a charitable and trusted partner um, into the community and providing us with the local knowledge, who should we be speaking to and what's the best way to, to get a message out about the project. And then the installer, obviously, the initial survey and technical advice, providing quotations and technical surveys and actually carrying out the installations themselves. If this works, um, this is uh, just a minute or so with um, Lindsay Mann from Sustainable West Linton. Um, she was working today, so um, rather than try to do a kind of dual presentation, um, I've uh, kind of recorded her saying a little bit about the project. So um, if I can get this to work. Do you have volume, Donna? Mm. I'm not sure about others, but I don't seem to have volume coming through here. Are you not hearing that? No, unfortunately not. Oh. But, uh, if you think there's a fix, please go back to uh, the, the starts. And, it's uh, playing fine through my headphones. That, that's a shame. Uh, um, I, I'll, I'll paraphrase. The, the, Lindsay is um, involved with the Sustainable West Linton Group, and um, she's also a homeowner that decided to go ahead with an installation in her own property. Um, so um, she 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 said that she really they appreciated the support that could be provided because n no one system is the same. Everybody has a very kind of tailored solution for their property, and there's a there's a lot of um, hand holding has been involved to to have people have the confidence and the the kind of. Uh, confidence from the quality assurance check. Um, I don't think Lindsay will mind me um, telling you that she's actually had the contractor out three times to to talk to her about her system because um, it is it's a completely different way of heating your home. You know we're so used to if you're on a an oil boiler, a gas boiler, you come in, the house is cold, you flick the switch, and 30 minutes later your your house is toasty and warm. But an air source heat pump is a you know a different way of heating your home. It's a lower background heat. You leave it on for longer. You adjust it with thermostatic controls. Um, and um, there's been a lot of kind of behaviour change and kind of, you know, just getting used to a different way of heating your home. Um, Lindsay says in the video that um, she hasn't tested her heating yet because she hasn't needed to have it on, but she said the hot, hot water's been fantastic um, and um, the, the heating will be going on soon so that they can um, make the most of that. So hopefully I can move this. Yeah. Now I've paused it. There we go. Okay. 
So in terms of the um, engagement that's been involved, um, this project was originally designed to have a lot more face-to-face -face engagement than, than it did. Um, uh, it's a minor detail um, as a, a, a pandemic <laughs> hit. So um, it also delayed a lot of the surveys that were done by the installer because under the Scottish Government um, guidelines, there couldn't be work done within homes um, up until about March this year. So um, we, we had a lot of time of keeping people warm where we'd engage with them early on and then then that work couldn't happen and um, but luckily we didn't seem to have too too much of a drop off we did have a couple of people that have gone ahead and used a different installer they were so keen that they decided just to go ahead and get somebody else in and obviously an installer that wasn't quite following the guidelines to not be doing work within homes and um, because some of them happened and um, before we went back out to start the project um, sustainable west linton have been really key to that community engagement for this project um, introducing us, like I say, as a trusted partner and, and um, telling us about, you know, the best farmers market to be at or the, the kind of best event. We did manage to do a few face to face events when um, restrictions allowed, which was great. But it has been really interesting to see how much has been able to be done online, um, as I suppose everybody's finding in their, their kind of online lives now. Um, we've done a lot of social marketing, so using some of the um, Sustainable West Linton have a, their own Facebook page and then there's a West Linton page, so um, we've been able to, to chat to a lot of householders through those means. Um, and we also ran, in partnership with Home Energy Scotland, a couple of webinars, um, which was great to, to have people get a lot more detail about um, systems and um, to ask questions directly of us, and then obviously the post-installation support. So delivery to date, as I say, we're part way through. Um, so there's been 55 referrals made through to the project. Um, there has been there's been six completed installations, and there's another three who have used a different installer. So nine in total in the um, the village. Um, five out of the six have applied for the HES loan, decided to go down that route, and we've got another six that are still active customers, so they're still going through the whole technical survey, applying for the the loan, um, and and hopefully we'll go ahead. Um, the installer have um, has done 17 um, quotations out to households and four of those um, went through to full technical survey um, uh, over and above those that have been installed. And um, we've got another three that were are pretty kind of definite that the, the contract is just about to be signed and they'll definitely go ahead, but uh, uh, six that are, are remaining active that will hopefully convert before the project comes to an end. In terms of evaluating our impact, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about the methodology for this and what we wanted to um, ask questions that we once wanted to answer. So we've um, recorded a lot of data that we will be analysing um, at the end of the project um, and in terms of the householder and property characteristics, their motivations, the feedback on the service and our kind of overall learning and conclusions. I think some of the kind of in oh sorry just the, the kind of let you, let you know when that'll happen so the, the outstanding installation should be complete by the end of November monitoring and evaluation complete um, by February and final reporting complete by by March but some of the kind of initial um, thoughts that we've had um, of the kind of essential ingredients of, of doing a project like this um, first of all, obviously, an active community and, and a community that has an appetite for change. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more communities that do have that appetite for change um, and, and getting on board with the kind of journey towards net zero. Um, a larger number of people that are willing to take those decisions, get involved. Um, and Sustainable West Linton were able to tell us there was already appetite there. There was already people that were, you know, expressed an interest in decarbonising their homes. Um, I expect uh, that this is some of the anecdotal things we've been told, but I expect this will come out really strongly in the evaluation. That the, the thing that households have appreciated the most is, is that hand-holding advice, the technical um, support and the, the QA support. Perhaps the need for that will become less as this becomes more of a mainstream technology, but when it's something that we're asking people to be fairly kind of early adopters um, in installing in their homes, um, that's been really important. Also the behaviour change support, so how to run a system, what to expect differently um, and um, tariff switching as well. The right finance package, like I say, we're, we're really lucky that that um, offer came along, but um, you know, just actually having access to loan funding for these types of projects, not everybody's got 13, 14,000 in the bank account to be able to put towards a project. Well, well developed contractor networks, if we hadn't been able to find a contractor, if we were in a more rural area where there wasn't anybody on hand to be able to um, uh, bid for the project through PCS, that would have obviously been an issue. Um, and then 
you know, how do you, we, we've, we've put um, our time into this project for free for the community because it's something that we wanted to explore. But, you know, th th there's parts of this that I think a community wouldn't be able to do for themselves, like the QA and the, the handholding advice. Um, how do we make that a model that communities um, can access going forward? So in summary, the project's still in delivery. We've learned a lot. I think the community have learned a lot um, from the delivery, from the engagement, um, from you know looking at the barriers and looking at some of the solutions to those barriers and looking at some of the myth busting that needs to be done around air source heat pumps. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions today and I'm obviously happy to, to share the final outcomes once the reporting is done at the end of, of March and everything's um, written up um, and just I'm always happy to explore if there's funding available for, uh, for piloting other models. Donna, thanks very much. That is absolutely fascinating, especially from my role as a sort of local heat development specialist. I think the, the angle that has in this project is this idea of the local sort of trust, the local community organisation galvanising, you know, sort of individuals action kind of through that. And that's certainly something that's mentioned in the sort of heat and building strategy for CARES to kind of support projects and things as well. So, yeah, very, very interesting in this idea of communities, community organisations acting as an anchor group on mm -hmm. behalf of their wider community in relation to sort of sort of heat projects. We have laboured on a bit, well not laboured, but we've got a wee bit to the edge of time, but I'm hoping